You may be seated. Everyone has priorities. Inevitably, our priorities change over time, and sometimes our priorities get out of place, but we all have priorities. And we reveal our priorities by what we plan for and what we invest in. The NFL season is starting soon, and a husband decided to write a letter to his wife about this upcoming NFL season, and uh, this is what he wrote to his wife. He said, Callie, two weeks from today is the start of the NFL season. The past several months, I have been an engaged, loving, helpful, and thoughtful husband and father. However, I must with remiss inform you that I am putting in my two-week notice. I will no longer be available for work on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., Monday evenings or Thursday evenings due to conflicting commitments. I will also be unavailable every Saturday due to conflicting commitments between the hours of 10 a.m. and 12 a.m. the next morning. This will be in effect until the end of February or early March. Thank you for your understanding. <laughs> now, obviously, he is writing this as a joke to his wife. 30 hours, if you add it up, it's 30 hours of NFL watching each week for six months. That is a lot of football. But if he was serious, uh, first, he would be dead. His wife would kill him. And second, we would all say that his priorities are out of whack, that his priorities are out of place. And see, this is one of the great challenges in life. It is learning to prioritize the right things and then keeping our priorities in the right place. And this morning, I would like to look at one of the key priorities in the Christian life. It's something that we know is right, but can easily, easily drift into the margins. And this is the priority of evangelism, the priority of evangelism. The word evangelism, it comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news, the good news of the gospel. And so to evangelize is to share the good news of what Jesus has accomplished for us through his life, death, and resurrection. Evangelism is offering the world forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And my goal this morning is not to guilt you into sharing the gospel. That's not what I'm chasing after. My goal is not to convince you of some method or strategy for evangelism. Rather, my goal, just to be clear, here it is, is that you would embrace evangelism as part of your walk with Jesus Christ. That you would embrace evangelism as part of your walk with Jesus Christ. And I know if you're married or you're single, if you're in full-time ministry or a stay-at-home mom, the frequency of evangelism and what it looks like, your methods and strategies are going to look very different. But see, we want to be the type of church that lives with the conviction that the good news of the gospel is too good to keep to ourselves. It is too good not to share with the world. And see, this is the attitude of the woman at the well. And so we're going to look at three, three principles for evangelism that comes from uh, the story of the woman at the well. So principle number one is that evangelism flows from satisfied souls. Where does evangelism come from? Well, evangelism naturally flows from satisfied souls. In John chapter 4, Jesus is talking with the woman at the well. And during the conversation, which, which just happens to be the longest conversation recorded in the Bible that Jesus has with anyone. It is, it is the conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well. And at the end of the conversation, Jesus reveals to her that he is the Christ. And in that moment, everything snaps into place in the mind of this woman. By the grace of God, the lights, the lights turn on and she sees, oh my goodness, I am in the presence of the Son of God. I am in the presence of the Christ. And in verse 28, she goes into the town and tells the people about Christ it says in verse 28, Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? If you were to ask this woman, Why are you telling the, the entire town about Jesus? She would say, Because Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And she is eager. Uh, John includes this little detail that she left her water jar at the well. Now, why did she leave her water jar? Well, there, there's a practical reason. She could move much more quickly. She could, she could get to that town a lot faster if she's not carrying this giant thing of water. There's also a theological point John is making. Uh, this woman came to the well thirsty. She's in search of water. But at the well, she found what her soul needed. At the well, she found what her soul was searching for. 
She saw that Jesus is the Christ. She saw that this is, this is the one for whom I have been created. I have been created not for uh, marriage, not for romance, not for drugs, not for money, not for the fame of this life. Rather, I have been created by him and for him. And her soul drank deeply. She was a changed woman. And there is a relationship between seeing Christ and wanting others to see Christ. Uh, the spring from which evangelism flows is joy in God. It is the joy of knowing God that makes you want other people to know the same joy, to know the same God. And joy has a way of turning you into an evangelist. This is true when it comes to the scriptures, but it's just true in life, that whatever your heart delights in, you want to talk about. You turn into an evangelist. Uh, recently, I was on an airplane, and you never know who's going to sit next to you on an airplane. And so I'm sitting there, and uh, this older woman sits next to me. She was in her 80s, a delightful older woman. And uh, we were talking, and I asked her the quest question. I said, do you have any kids? And she says, I have a lot of kids, and I have a lot of grandkids. And I said, oh, that is awesome. She says, but my kids have four paws. And I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> four paws. Here, here we go. And she says, do you want to see them? And I thought, I can't say no. So I guess yes. I'm sitting on an airplane. And she pulls out her iPad. And she proceeds to show me 15,000 pictures of her dogs. I mean, generations of dogs that she has had all of these pictures. She's just swiping. And this is this dog. And this is this dog. And this is this dog. And they were all ugly. They were ugly. And I told her that. I said, your, your kids are ugly, woman. This is awful. And I didn't say that. But that's what I'm thinking. They're not even good-looking dogs. Now, why did this woman... Talk to me without shame for 90 minutes. She was shameless. She would have gone on for five hours. Why did she do this? Well, Matthew 12, verse 34 says, For the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. From, from out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is in our hearts eventually spills out of our mouths. And if God is the great joy of our heart, evangelism will spill out. I'm not saying that you need to become a traveling evangelist or go door to door, gold, go uh, cold turkey evangelizing. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that if God is the great joy, the great treasure of your life, it's going to spill out. You're going to tell people about what Christ has done for you. And in the same way, evangelism begins to die when our hearts, when our hearts delight in something more than God. Uh, why does evangelism die in a church? It's not because a church makes a decision, hey, we're going to stop evangelizing. That's not what happens. It's because over the course of time, our, heart, our hearts delight in something else more than God. And so what's ever in our heart, it comes out of our mouth. And if God is not the great joy of our heart, then evangelism dies. Now, I saw this uh, tomato plant not recently, and I had to take a picture of it. Uh, I'm sure some of you have tomato plants that look like this, but I saw this and I thought this, is the Christ this can be the Christian life for many people. Now, why do I say this? Well, first, there's fruit. There's some nice cherry tomatoes there. There is fruit. And if you're a Christian, because you have the Holy Spirit, God will produce fruit in your life. But obviously, this tomato plant is not very healthy at all. This tomato plant does not need more friends. This tomato plant does not need more education, doesn't need more training. Uh, this tomato plant needs to drink deeply. It needs water. And so many people, so many Christians are trying to do ministry because in their brain they know that it's right. And they feel guilty if they don't do ministry. But their souls are not drinking deeply of Christ. And so after a year, two years, five years, ten years, ministry becomes such a burden. And because it's such a burden, we are tempted to explain away our lack of evangelism. We begin to excuse, okay, why we haven't had a gospel conversation in 10 years. Why is that? We begin to justify it. And I think, no, no. The issue is not that we need more training. The issue is not that we need more guilt. The issue is that our souls need to drink deeply of Christ. When Christ is our treasure, it comes out. He will come out of our mouth. And you see this with this woman. She is eager. She's excited. Uh, at one point, it was what she had done that caused her to be ashamed and an outcast in society. But now she says, this, this man came into my life and exposed my sin, and yet he's forgiven me. He, he, he's made me a new person. And so this becomes the platform by which she tells her town about the good news of Christ. And so principle number one, principle number one, is that evangelism flows 
from satisfied souls. Principle number two is that God wants to work through me or through you to influence the people around me, around you, around us, for Christ. God wants to work in us, wants to work through us to influence the people around us for Christ. Verse 28, then the woman left her water jar, went into town. Now, when I was studying this week, I just had to stop here. Then the woman left her water jar, went into town. She, she went into this town where she's an outcast. Remember, she came all by herself. She came to the well at noon all by herself because she doesn't have friends. All the women in the town would go together in the morning and in the evening. The fact that she comes alone at the heart, hottest part, part of the day means she's an outcast. So she goes back into town where her reputation is ruined. Uh, she doesn't have uh, the respect of the people. And she goes into the town and she tells the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? You know, many Christians... Wonder, rightfully wonder, is God calling me to be a missionary? Should I take the good news of the gospel to the ends of the earth? And that's a great question. And the answer is maybe. God might be calling you to go to the ends of the earth. But if you ask a different question, does God want to work through me to influence the people around me for Christ? You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to pray about that one. The answer is yes, he does. That, that is his plan. He saves people, and then he uses the people that he saves to turn the world upside down. Now, obviously, we have limited resources. We cannot give equal time and attention to everyone in our lives. However, it is quite helpful in our souls to be settled on this, on this issue, to be settled on this truth that God wants to work through me to influence the people around me for Christ. He, he, if you're in school, he wants to work through you to influence the people you're taking classes with for Christ. If you're uh, if you have a job, you're working someplace, God wants to work through you to influence the people around you for Christ. Neighbors, the families that your kids play sports with, all of that, all of those people in your area, God wants to work through you. And again, I'm not saying he's gonna work through you equally you need to, or that you need to divide your time up equally to every person, give your attention equally to every person. That's not what I'm saying. But just living with the awareness that wherever you go today, that God wants to work through you to influence the people around you for Christ. And we can't miss the person that God is working through to influence this Samaritan town. You know, if I asked you for the profile of the type of man or the type of woman that God would use to advance his kingdom, uh, probably a lot of us would say, well, God wants to use someone who has a lot of Bible knowledge, who can answer all of the questions, who's really good socially, high social IQ, someone with a good rep reputation, someone with a good job, someone with a good family. Uh, someone, someone who's been in a, a town for a long period of time, or, or whatever it is, we would come up with a list of the type of person that God would use. And that person would probably be Nicodemus from John chapter 3. Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel. He was well respected. He was wealthy. He had gone through all the different seasons of life. Yet, in John chapter 3, we see that Nicodemus leaves, still not clear in his mind over who Jesus Christ is. And then we come to John chapter 4. And we meet this idolatrous, adulterous woman, Samaritan woman, the outcast. And she sees who Christ is, and God is using this woman to reach the whole town. All throughout the scriptures, we see that God loves to use the unlikely, the forgotten, the weak, the humble, to change the world. This is the story of the Bible. He loves to use the forgotten the unlikely, to change the world. Now, why does he love to use the weak to change the world, to do great things? Why does he love that? Well, because if God only worked through the most intelligent people, if God only worked through uh, the most wealthy people, then the world could explain what was going on. If, if God used the best-looking people on the planet, if God used the wealthiest people on the planet to advance his kingdom, then the world would just say, well, of course Christianity is going to spread. These are the best looking people on the planet. These are the richest people on the planet. These are the smartest people on the planet. But see, when God uses the weak to change the world, then God is honored. Then the only explanation the world has is that God must be real. When God works through weak people, ordinary people, then it abounds to his glory. And so he loves it. He loves using weak people. This Samaritan woman has almost everything working against her. In verse 27, it says that the disciples were amazed that Jesus was even talking to her. 
They show up in verse 27. They're like, why are you even talking to her? In that culture, you did not talk to women in public. Samaritan, Samaritan fathers and Samaritan rabbis would not teach women the scriptures because they said they're not smart enough to understand it. We're not going to waste our time teaching women the Bible because they can't even understand it. And yet here's Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman in public. And it's this Samaritan woman who goes into the town and leads all the people to faith in Christ. In verse 6, we see that she has a bad reputation. She's been married five times and divorced five times. Or maybe her husband's died or something. But five times, married and, married and remarried five times. And the man that she is living with is not her husband. She is an immoral Samaritan woman. And she doesn't know very much. In verse 22, Jesus says, you worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. You're worshiping without knowledge. And she knows very little about Christ. And yet, look at the result in verse 39. Now, the Samaritans from that town believed in him. Why? How did the Samaritans come to faith in Christ? Because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. This whole town and more are going to come to faith in Christ. God is not looking for the most intelligent He's not looking for those who have mastered all of the arguments. It's good to learn. It's good to master the arguments, but that's not the limiting principle. God is looking for a man or a woman who will look at him and say, God, use my life. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. That is what he's looking for. Are you that type of man? Are you that type of man? Are you that type of woman? Surrendered unto God. If we're going to reach our city with the gospel, if we're going to impact the college campuses with the gospel, it won't be because God has raised up a few really good preachers. It will be because God has raised up an army, the church, a group of the redeemed, those who have been saved by the grace of God, those who treasure God, who embrace the responsibility, the opportunity to tell the world about what Christ has done. We need more men and women like this Samaritan woman who will go and tell the world about the good news of Christ. And so principle number two is that God wants to work through you to influence the people around you for Christ. Principle number three is that evangelism increases our joy in Christ. Evangelism increases our joy in Christ. Jesus is not calling us to evangelize because he hates us. That's not, that's, he's not like, I want to ruin your life. So go evangelize because it's going to ruin your life. That's not what he's after at all. And sometimes it can feel that way. Like some of you, as you're sitting here, you're just thinking about how uncomfortable you are about the idea of talking to another human being about Christ, and you're like, it's going to ruin my life. No more friends. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. But it's, it's going to be terrible. And sometimes there are very negative consequences that come along with sharing the truth. I don't want to downplay that at all. But we have to remember that Jesus is not inviting us to tell the world about what he's done for them so that he will ruin our lives. Rather, he wants to increase our joy in God. It is for our good. He wants to increase our joy in God. Verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. He says, that which nourishes my soul, that which satisfies my soul, is to do the will of God and to finish, this, and finish his work. This is a reference to Jesus going to the cross and dying. He lived a perfect life, a totally righteous life in obedience to his Father, and he finished the work on the cross so that when he's hanging on the cross, remember Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem. He's falsely accused. He stands trial before the Sanhedrin. He's condemned at the hands of Pilate. He's flogged, he's mocked, he's beaten. A crown of thorns goes on his head. And then he carries a cross, and he's tortured, and he dies. And as he's dying, he says, it's finished. He says, I've accomplished the work that my father sent me to do. I came to die. I've been righteous in every way, and it is finished. See, life is not found in avoiding all possible danger. Life is not found in being as comfortable as you can possibly be. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And see, Jesus is inviting his disciples and he's inviting us to join him in that work, to join him in what he is doing in the world. 
which is a wonderful, it is just a wonderful invitation to give our lives away for the glory of Christ. Now, why does evangelism increase our joy in God? There are many reasons. I'm going to give you a couple. First, evangelism changes the world. Evangelism changes the world. Evangelism really matters. I'm not saying that evangelism is the only pursuit in life that matters. There are many pursuits that matter. But there are many pursuits in life that feel like they really matter, but they don't really matter. But evangelism really matters. Verse 35, Jesus says, don't say, or don't you say, there are still four more months and then comes the harvest. Listen to what I'm telling you, he says this. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. In context, the fields that are ready for harvest are the Samaritans. The woman went into the town. She told the town that Christ is here, the Messiah is here, and now they're coming out. They're coming out to listen uh, to Jesus. And he says, guys, you're so preoccupied with food. You're just normal dudes, you're normal guys, young men, preoccupied with food. What are we gonna eat? You need to eat, Rabbi. And he says, no, no, no. Open your eyes. Look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. This phrase, gathering fruit for eternal life, is talking about people. Gathering fruit for eternal life means that there are lost people, dead people, people under the wrath of God who come into the kingdom of God. They gain eternal life through faith in Christ. And he says, he says stop focusing on the food here. Open your eyes. Don't you see these people created in my image, the image of God, that need the gospel? And he says, I want you to help me, help them get into the kingdom of God. I want to work through you to help them get into the kingdom of God. And see, this woman, this Samaritan woman, is already doing the work. She's sowing these seeds in the town. She is laboring in the harvest. And see, I don't think anybody wants to waste their lives. No one says, you know what I want to do? I want to waste my life. I want to give my life to things that don't matter at all. Nobody wants that. But inevitably, most people will waste their life. They will waste their lives on things that don't matter. They will invest their time and money and relationships just for the temporary pleasures of this life. But see, evangelism is dealing with eternal matters. Evangelism is the tip of the spear in the spiritual battle. See, it's through the gospel that we offer the world a new life in Christ. It's in the gospel we offer people a new hope, a new freedom, a new family, a new God, a new future. I mean, this woman who came to faith in Christ, her life was forever changed. It was changed in this life and changed forever. She was under the wrath of God. She was on her way to hell, but now she's in the kingdom of God. Now she has been reconciled to God through faith in Christ. She will not spend eternity in hell. I mean, hell is a reality. It's a real place where people go. Many of you here this morning, if you were to die, you're gonna go to hell. Like, this is the reality that we live in. Not every, just because you're here, it doesn't mean you go to heaven. And see, people need the gospel. People need to come to faith in Christ that they don't die in their sin, separate from God and hell. And so the good news of the gospel is offering people eternal life. Come and live. Come and be forgiven. Come and know God. It is a great offer. And this offer has a ripple effect today, right now. It doesn't just change people for eternity. It doesn't just change our, our eternal destination. It changes our lives now. I, I, I hear so many stories. I know you hear these stories as well, but there's so many stories of uh, men and women who grew up in broken homes, you know, maybe where their dad was totally gone or abusive or cheated on their mom or an alcoholic, the list goes on and on. Or maybe a mom was totally dysfunctional, cheated on her husband, your dad, addicted to drugs or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, there's just a million examples of broken homes and there's something about the cycle in families that gets repeated from one generation to the next. Or uh, one man was an alcoholic and his son becomes an alcoholic or his kids become alcoholics. Uh, one man leaves his wife and kids and 
those sons grow up and they leave their wives and kids. And it just keeps repeating and keeps repeating and keeps repeating over and over and over again. And one of the great joys of my life is seeing young men and women who grow up in broken homes come to faith in Christ and they get married. And you watch them build these families. You you watch these dads say, I'm going to be the type of dad that I wish I would have had. Totally loyal to their wife. Sacrificing for their kids. The type of mom that says, I'm going to be totally faithful to this man and these kids for the rest of my life. And, and you see that it, sets, it just changes the trajectory of that family for a long period of time. It, it breaks the cycle of sin. It's a beautiful thing to see people who were once addicted to pornography gain freedom in Christ. People who are living for the, the praise of this world come to a place where they really care most deeply about pleasing God and the freedom that comes along with that. I mean, it just changes everything. The ripple effect is amazing. And so Jesus, he's, he's looking at his disciples and he says, do you sense the opportunity that's sitting right in front of you? Do you sense it? Look at these people. They're coming. Do you sense the opportunity? Verse 36, the reaper is already receiving pay. Well, what's the pay? He's not talking about $100 bills, stuffing $100 bills in, in your pocket. That's not what he's talking about. The pay is joy and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together, so that there's joy. There's joy in just communicating the truth of the gospel. And so God wants to increase your joy in him by joining him in the harvest. Evangelism changes the world. You know, our world and our country is so broken right now. It's just obviously broken. I was listening to a guy talk the other day, and he says, you know, when I look at our country, he goes, I wish there was a way to just unplug our country and then plug it back in. And just see, you know, would that fix it? You just unplug it and then just plug it in. Or is there like a restart button? We just, it's like we're in this glitch, and it just is not working, and And I want to be clear that I think politics are important. Some people will say politics don't matter at all. Politics are important, no doubt about that. But there are no political solutions to the fundamental problems we face as a country. There are no political solutions. Why? Because people don't know God. What's wrong with our country? People don't know God. And so the harvest is so big. So many people cut off from God. What our country needs and what the world needs is men and women who will go into the world like this Samaritan woman, who will go into the world like the Lord Jesus Christ and tell them about the forgiveness that they can have in him. Tell them about the freedom that they can have in Christ, the eternal life that is in Jesus Christ through his life, death, and resurrection. And so evangelism, it changes the world. Reason number two is that evangelizing reminds us of God's grace, or evangelism reminds us of God's grace. You know, when you sit down with someone, maybe you've had this experience, but you're talking to, to, to them about the Lord, and you just feel like you say the wrong thing, or it doesn't go very well. And then, a week later, a month later, a year later, you see that God used that conversation, that that conversation that you wish had gone differently, you see how God used that conversation to impact someone's life. And in those moments, when you don't do your best, you, you just thank God, because you say, oh man, God, thank you for using me, even in my broken attempt. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to see how God is faithful to honor his word. Even when you don't do the best you feel like you could do. Or there are times when you just give the best gospel presentation you could ever imagine. There have been times where I'll, I'll lay out the gospel, and at the end of the gospel presentation, I think, I want to become a Christian again. I mean, this was a good gospel presentation. This is really good. I want to recommit my life to Christ. This is glorious. Really good. And then you look at their face. Glazed eyes. They don't care. Totally dead in their sin. Hard-hearted. And you think, what's the difference between them and you? Why do you see, but they're blind? It's because of God's grace. It's because of his grace. And so there's something about just telling other people about Christ that's driving the truth of the gospel down deeper into your soul so that you live with the hope of the gospel more and more and more and more and more. It's like you're convinced over and over and over again all the more 
of the truth of the gospel as you talk to people about Christ. You know, sometimes we can believe the lie that it's all up to us when you, you're thinking about a friend or a coworker or a family member and you just think to yourself, this is all up to me. Like, it's all up to me. If I, so I gotta be perfect in my gospel presentation in the way I talk with them, I gotta answer every question. I, I just gotta get everything right. And if I don't get it right, then, it, then they're not gonna come to faith in Christ and I failed. But see, that's a lie. Uh, one of the great truths that we see in this passage is that God is at work in the harvest. Uh, with or without you, he's at work in the harvest. He is working. He is accomplishing his purposes. And Jesus says to his disciples in verse 38, he says, I sent you, disciples, to reap what you didn't labor for. This is speaking of the Samaritans who are gonna come into the kingdom of God. He says, you guys are gonna help them get into the kingdom of God, but you didn't sow the seeds, but you're gonna help them get in. Others have labored. Who, who has labored? Moses labored when he wrote the five books of the law. The Samaritans believed in those books, nothing else, but they believed in those books. Moses labored. The Samaritan woman labored. And he says, and you have benefited from their labor. And see, when someone comes to faith in Christ, you have the joy, the privilege of leading someone to faith in Christ. Uh, very, very rarely are you the first person that has ever shared the gospel with them, especially in our country. What you will see is that maybe they've had a mom or a dad praying for them, sharing the truth with them, maybe a friend who shared the gospel with them, and eventually you have the joy of leading them to Christ. Other people have been laboring. Situations have been unfolding in their life where God is drawing them to the to himself. I had a friend in college, a good friend of mine. He was an atheist. He became more and more of an atheist as uh, he got further into his college career. But we had many, many conversations back and forth. He thought it was dumb. And we would, so he would, it was a very live, very, we had very lively conversations. And when we graduated, I looked at him, gave him a hug, and I thought, I'm never going to see him again. He's more rooted in his atheism now than he was as a freshman. And about 10 years after that, I got a phone call from this man, and he said, Dan, he said, my son, uh, I can't remember if he was two or three years old, but he had a little boy who was totally healthy, he appeared totally healthy, and he just fell down. This little boy just collapsed, wasn't responsive, they took him to the ER, they found out he had a heart problem, and so he had to have emergency uh, heart surgery, didn't know if he was going to make it or not, and so just in a few minutes, he went from, life is good, my, my boy is dying, or might die. And he said, in that moment, he says, I couldn't not pray. He said, for the first time in my life, I couldn't not pray. And I had to pray. And he said, I thought about all these conversations that we had had. And he said, eventually I went to a church that preached the gospel. I met some Christians. They shared the gospel with me. And I gave my life to Christ. And he was just calling me to let me know that 10 years later. And I share that story not to say, wow, Dan, good job. Way to go share the gospel with them in college. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there are times when you sow seeds and you feel like a total failure. It just feels like it's so hard-hearted. Like you're just sharing the truth and they're just mocking you. And you're like, it doesn't even matter. And all I'm saying is you just don't know what God might do with that. When those seeds go into people's souls, you don't know when they'll take root and change people's lives. And so... Jesus says, he says, he wants the sower and the reaper to rejoice together. See, evangelism, it, it is an individual sport, and it's a team sport. It's a church sport. It's something we do as individuals, and it's something that we do as a body, as the people of God, and he wants us to rejoice together. And so as we go down that path of telling others about Christ, we are reminded more and more of his grace of his grace. Now, what do we do with this information? Well, just one point of application for you this morning. Open your eyes and see. Open your eyes and see. The reason Jesus tells his disciples to open their eyes is not because they're in rebellion to him. They're not in rebellion. These are the disciples. These are the people who said, I want to follow you. These were Jesus' disciples. And yet, he has to look at them and say, open your eyes. Why? because they were fixed on food. In the story, that's what's going on. They're fixed on food. They're obsessed with food. There's nothing wrong with food, but their eyes were distracted. They weren't paying attention to the right thing. And I think we can be genuine followers of Christ, and over the course of time, our eyes 
get focused on food. Our eyes get focused on things that are maybe not bad, but shouldn't consume our attention. And, and I believe that the Lord Jesus uh, w- would say to us what he said to his disciples. Open your eyes. Who's around you? Who's around you? Neighbors, coworkers, family members. Who can you pray for? Who can you begin to love? Who can you invite to church? Who can you invite to a Bible study? Who can you study the scriptures with? Who can you invite into your home? And certainly it requires judgment. And I've talked to a lot of people who say, Dan, can you just like give me a script? Can you just write a script for me so I know what to say to people? And I'm like, it doesn't work that way. I wish it did. I mean, scripts can be helpful, but it doesn't work that way. See, it's designed to be a journey that you take with the Lord Jesus Christ where you are in tune with him, where you are walking with him. So you can't just come up with this robot script that works. That works. It doesn't work that way. He wants to disciple us as we evangelize. One man said, a ship in a harbor is safe. A ship in a harbor is safe. But that is not what ships were made for. And I think as Christians, if we want to live a very safe life, don't ever tell anyone about Christ. Don't open your mouth. Don't take any risks. Don't invite anyone to church. Don't ever ask someone to study the Bible with them. Don't pray for people. Just keep your head down. You will live a, a quote, safer life. A ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are made for. And see, as Christians, we're not designed to, just to keep our head down and stay alive. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And you think, no, that can't be true. I'm too weak. <laughs> he says, I know. <laughs> you are weak. You're just who I'm looking for. And so, brothers and sisters, let's be the salt. Let's be the light. And let's see what the Lord does. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.